And now let me introduce you to Joanne Canning. Joanne has been a master gardener for 25 years now, and over the past 45 years has been a home orchardist, an ornamental plant enthusiast, and an urban food gardener. Having lived in such diverse climates as, the, as Eastern Canada, Southwest America, and the United Kingdom, she is convinced that successful gardening means following nature's rules. Joanne has piloted a number of community gardening projects. She has lectured and presented seminars for several gardening associations and for the Vancouver Island University Horticulturist Program. Her articles and photographs can be found in many gardening magazines, newsletters, and websites. And among her other roles, she's a mentor to new Vancouver Island Master Gardener Association members. And as I mentioned, it is through her hard work and coordination that, her, that the partnership with Vancouver Island Regional Library has made these workshops po so popular and such a success. So without further ado, Joanne Canning. Well, thank you. I already got a, a, a question here, so I was just quickly writing that. Um, hello. Today, we're going to actually end up talking about more than uh, just the uh, spring bulbs. We're going to be talking uh, about bulbs in general. And uh, one moment, I'm going to shift my screen here just a moment. I uh, wanted to get rid of my little face. Um, so uh, this is uh, presented um, by a partnership of the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and the Nanaimo Harborfront branch of the Vancouver Island Regional Library. Um, the uh, bit of uh, housekeeping we need to do is to let you know that this is copyrighted material and that uh, the co-owners are the above mentioned. Want to let you know a bit about who the master gardeners are, because we're not just a few people on the island. Um, we're an international association of uh, specially trained teachers. We volunteer and we have to keep our own education up to stay current with all the science that's going on in horticulture. And so we work in partnership with a lot of public sectors and private enterprises to teach sustainable horticultural knowledge and methods. Now, um, we are an educational seminar, um, but you will see that certain images um, have um, the owners written on them. Most of them uh, of the images are mine. Um, the ones that are noted um, have been uh, taken from public domain internet, uh, internet uh, sources or commercial enterprise marketing materials in the public domain. And that's why we acknowledge the owner on the item face and we thank them for their use in this educational seminar. Um, please don't um, uh, copy any of this except for your own edification. And that's about it for housekeeping, I think. Let's get on to the meat of the matter. Now, why do we wanna grow geophytes? Hmm. Well, there are actually lots of good reasons as you can see. And one of the things in the background to think about in gardening today is climate change, of course. So choosing plants um, that are the first one, long-lived perennial, um, that they're easy to care for, uh, that they naturalize, and we'll talk about naturalizing later on, and that um, they provide more than one season of pleasure. Now, every one uh, of those you will um, find in bulbs. They're also very versatile and many of them are quite um, old cultivars. And so they've been hybridized and developed for exquisite blooms, some of the most spectacular in the garden. And they can make cut flowers and you can also force them and all these things we'll be talking about. Um, they're also, when you look at buying perennials, um, they have a fairly modest cost. And that's, I think, uh, very important. Um, so as you can see, look at this. 
that Willow's Nursery in the UK, that's winter. Isn't it beautiful? So why not grow them? Um, now, what do they, um, what do they have um, in common that make them important in the um, garden? Um, and we'll take a look at that. But in order to do that, we're gonna start with a bit of botany. And don't roll your eyes, guys. Um, although I personally think it's a wonderful subject on its own. As a gardener, this botany service is to help you be a more successful gardener. And knowing bulb botany is a very important key because they're a very special kind of plant. Um, and so understanding background and the way they react uh, with the uh, uh, climate and the, the gardening environment is probably as in, more important than just about any other garden plant. So that's why we want to go back to this. And I will be referring to these botany basics as we go through the, the gardening. Now, they're very, very tough, resilient plants. Um, but they're very, very particular, kind of like a cat, really love you, but on its own terms. Um, and the other thing that's important about, about bulbs that people don't often think about is that when they go dormant, um, they retreat back into the soil. They have evolved that way for some very special reasons. This means we don't know if they're in trouble. If we have a deciduous tree in our front yard that is broken by wind, we can go out and repair that branch. If it gets um, its roots loose, we can go out and take care of that. But with a bulb, once it goes dormant, you don't know, is it gonna come up the next year? And that's why understanding the basics and the gardening uh, setup for bulbs is important. Many of you will say, oh, I get my tulips, I get my daffodils, I just throw them in the ground, they do just fine. You know what? Because they're geared to your type of garden and our type of climate. But many of our favorite bulbs actually aren't, even though they're successful, but they're successful because of smart gardeners. Um, so they all, uh, all bulb-like plants are called geophytes. In other words, um, those who live and love in the ground. So kind of neat. Greek is, is kind of neat. Um, the, um, uh, all of them are perennials, which we had mentioned. Um, and they all, every bulb evolved in some sort of extreme climate condition, either um, on the edge of a climate zone, say you'll see a lot of them uh, in mountainous regions, uh, where the seasonal change was either unpredictable or sudden, or uh, they were like desert, they were on the deserts um, or the edges of deserts. And if anybody has uh, been uh, around deserts, they know that it can be 100 degrees during the day and freezing at night. And these plants all evolved survival strategies. And the, these survival systems um, help them get through hard times. Um, so they all have an extra reproductive system. And that um, actually that reproductive system is within their extra storage system. The extra storage system is the bulb because they um, can clone themselves, but they have normal reproduction systems uh, or is what we think of as normal. In other words, seeds and uh, pollen and, and like that. Um, and I'm gonna lean over, you can see um, uh, this picture behind me. You see, that's a, that's a Egyptian walking onion. And there's the bulbils on top. And um, they are part of a cloning system, even though they look like, like seeds. Now, these evolutionary advantages um, helped people. Um, they first helped themselves um, because um, they were responding in, in a manner to protect their survival. So 
here's a high plains desert and all the uh, herds of unculants are traipsing through. And of course, they're all going to get eaten. So what do they do? They bloom really fast and then retreat into the ground before the animals can eat them. Or they might have very tall leaves and short stems. So the browsers um, have difficulty getting to the, uh, um, the good bits. Uh, so what now? The um, advantages uh, are that they give us lots of blooms. And within a species uh, or within a genus, we can draw on species from all over the world with similar cli uh, uh, climates. Uh, now the disadvantage is that they um, have the shortest bloom time of any perennial. Uh, now, as I say, you got migrating herds. This uh, this fellow had to get out and, and get the flowers done and then retreat into the ground before the herd could get to it. And they retreated deep enough that they couldn't be dug up. In most cases, they were safe. And uh, that's why every bulb, when it forms, has what's called a contractile root. And every bulb, um, and you can see my little onion here, um, on the base is the basal plate. And it had, that's where the roots grow of this particular bulb. And the first thing that comes out is a contractile root. And it is um, part of the root system that is also storing uh, food. It has another important um, chicken and egg. How did the bulb get in the ground? And if the bulb or the plant that produces bulbs uh, was spread by seed, how did the bulb get in the ground? And it's the contractile root. It pulls itself down, gathers up food to make sure the bulb is viable and then contracts. And it will do that um, until the bulb is at the correct depth for that species. This is important when we go to plant. And it's also important why you have to protect the roots of bulbs. Um, so what else have we got? We have five types of geophytes. And to me, they're absolutely fascinating, um, but I'm going to run through them um, quickly. Um, many of them look very similar, but their differences are really what's important. And understanding a bit about their differences will really help the gardener um, to know how, how to orient them in the ground and how to treat them. Um, you, you, you treat um, a bulb different than a corm, different than a tuber, different than a rhizome, and different from uh, a tuberous root. And we'll talk a bit about that in planting. Um, it, also, it also means, for instance, where you have true bulbs, um, and the one that is most obvious is, let me see, where's my, there we go, is the onion. Okay, there we go. That's a true bulb, just like a, um, a tulip or a daffodil. Now, corms often look very much like bulbs, but when, if you have any essential part of a bulb missing, um, then um, you can tell that it's a corm. And they're different in as much as the corm, where the bulb produces the flower, the corn produces the flower and completely uses itself up in that year while it is also producing another corn to take its place, um, sometimes several of them. This is important to the gardener because corms need richer soil than bulbs do because they're drawing more from the soil than a bulb will. So when you're reading those packages, pay attention. Um, now, rhizomes um, are horizontal under 
ground stems because all the extra storage systems that you see on the page here have all been developed from other parts of the plant. They've all evolved naturally. And the rhizome was a stem and it grows just below the surface, sometimes on top of the surface, just like uh, as you see in an iris. And people who uh, will come to us master garden say, well, my irises were doing just fine. And now they're just kind of rotting and, and I mulch them and everything. Yeah, yeah, you're not supposed to. You, they're supposed to be very close to the surface. They need that light. They have actually quite long roots. Um, one end grows upward. It is um, phototrophic. Um, the other one is geotrophic. Uh, and that end, you'll have the roots. And those roots are very important. They don't have the strong, strong uh, contact, contractile root of the bulb, but their roots are long. Uh, more like a shrub, if you will, and strong to hold them in place. Um, now, the gardener has to know which is which. And if you take a look at um, a rhizome, uh, you will see one end um, has kind of a little nose on it. And the roots are down at the other end. So you know how to plant it. Now, tubers are... Um, modified stems, um, big plump underground stems, whereas the rhizomes are flatter and longer and they usually uh, are planted in a circle. Uh, so with the roots outward. Um, so they, they do well on kind of rocky ground. Uh, tubers, um, well, think of the potato, that's a tuber. So they have more than one growing point. And this is important because they involved in areas um, that the ground might would get disturbed. And um, if one part of the um, uh, tuber was destroyed, it had other eyes. And depending on which way the tuber is, uh, play, is facing, um, they can form roots or stems and leaves. Um, and that underground environment tells them the amount of light coming through of all sorts of things. Now, the last group is uh, tuberous roots. Now, this is kind of interesting because they're modified and enlarged specialized horizontal roots, and they gather at the base of the growing stem. And they get replaced um, uh, by new storage units um, each year. Um, we all eat sweet potatoes. That's a tuberous root as opposed to a potato, which is a tuber. So during this holiday season, take a look at those two little puppies and you will begin to see the botanical difference. Um, the tuberous roots don't have eyes, the tubers do. Now, um, as I said, they get replaced by new storage units uh, every year. Um, now, the other thing that the gardener needs to be concerned about in dealing with geophytes is that sometimes um, up is hard to tell. Now, with things like irises, um, you can see it. With, um, uh, with tubers, doesn't matter so much. Um, with corms, they, um, boy, I'll, I'll tell you, I have to look closely often with some of the corms and even some of the bulbs um, to see, um, okay, which way is up. Rule of thumb, if you're not sure, because every bulb, every corn is slightly flattened, turn it on its side. Um, the geotrophic um, spots on the bottom, on the basal plate, as they call it, um, are attracted to the ground. And the uh, phototropic ones where the leaves and stems grow are attracted to the light, which is again, why you need to know how deep to plant them. And um, if you're going to air, planting a little deeper um, is your better bet. So each of those things can turn the corner. It will slow them. You may have a later bloom, but then when they replace themselves, they will have righted themselves just right. So let's look at 
the kind of bulbs that we'll see every season. Um, and um, as I said before, most bulbs will come in packages with growing instructions. Save that calendar. They're very, very good. Later on, and you'll have them in your handouts, um, I've included a lot of calendars. And uh, so everyone here today will have that. And if you um, haven't printed it out, you can print it out. If um, you visit again, you will find all these on a slide. So you can do a print screen and, and get it printed out. So isn't this lovely? Here we have gladiolas and dahlias. And here's winter. Now, sometimes it's um, a little confusing because what most people call winter, um, we call early spring. We kind of have two springs, a cold spring that begins in February and the normal spring that the rest of Canada has in May. But this is technically winter. It's late winter. And look at all these blooms. We have, um, let me see, do I have a pen? I had a pen, not gonna worry about it. Um, upper, uh, upper left, uh, this is winter aconite. Um, across the top, we have um, crocus chrysanthus and one of my all time favorites, uh, crocus tomisiana, which is the one that you see growing in the grasses and we'll talk about that. Dead center, we have the beautiful Chianodoxa, far left, we have the very tiny and very, very early. They come out before the crocus do. They come out about the same time as the snowdrops. Um, and that is Iris reticulata that also comes in yellow. And then we have some white um, crocus. And of course, the bottom left that used to bloom in January for me, um, the snowdrops, Galanthus. Now, this is Tulipatarda. And um, I always planted it in a place in my garden that had a, had a drab brown spot because those yet that yellow is so bright, it will just knock your socks off. This is a species tulip. And this tulip was the only one that the deer would leave alone. Interesting. So here we have the big show. Um, now uh, I included this one in the upper left because we probably won't see this this spring. That's Abbotsford. And that's the Fraser Valley Tulip Festival. We may uh, have saved a few of them, but there we go. And the one in the far right is Laconner, Washington. That's their tulip festival. Um, we have um, daffodils, which are actually a type of narcissus. Down in the bottom left, we have uh, hyacinths. We have grape hyacinths, these little fellows that are so beautiful. And at the far right, there's some Darwin hybrids, the red ones, very old tulip, and that little orange one at the bottom, that is a species tulip. So now we begin to move in to late spring through summer and our blossoms begin to get spectacular. This of course is when the rest of the world <laughs> wakes up. We, we deal with the more subtle things earlier on. And uh, dead center are the alliums, that's from Bantu, Bantu's and Botanical Garden. And yet down in the bottom right, that's Allium moly. And it's a, it's a lovely border plant because it um, makes, makes a mass, it's quite lovely. Um, the two on the left are Dyke's Metal Winners, uh, the one up, up left was a, a collection of, from my old friend Star, and that's called um, Jesse's Song, and then Brilliant Disguise. Um, Dykes medals um, are um, given to the best iris grown that year. Um, tulips also have an international award, and the upper right, um, of course, is a lily. Here's another lily. And, we'll, and you've got a planting calendar for lilies because they do, um, you can really extend their bloom. And they also just love to be uh, um, in containers. Um, so we have um, a tiger lily in the upper right, a dahlia. And then down on the left side, we have some gladiolas. And one of my absolutely favorite uh, type of gladiola, it's called a gladiola, um, 
uh, Calanthus, or um, uh, I'm okay, Calantha. It used to be called Acidinthera, but it had been changed. It's a little bit um, uh, tender. You have to be careful and make sure it gets um, care over winter. And of course, the very tough and very wonderful Crocosmia, that's the hummingbird um, uh, draw. And um, this is um, a perennial sour, uh, sunflower. They actually do exist. Perennial sunflower is smaller, multiple blossoms, and of course, a wild bee on it. So moving into autumn, you can see in the center the perennial sunflower, um, the uh, uh, clivia and the nerine, and then at the far right, the famous saffron uh, crocus of Turkey. Um, the one in the bottom left I used to just love because they're, they're quite odd looking. They're called toad lilies, uh, and you can see why. That's the tricertus, a really fun one, which is huge. Um, those are um, um, uh, colo colocasia. Um, that's the taro plant. And look how big they are. I kept the person in the image uh, to give you a sense of it. Um, there's also a plant called alocasia, um, which looks similar. It's not um, a taro plant. And it has very, uh, it has large blossoms, not quite as big as the, as the uh, taro, it's um, the elephant ears. Um, it is very brightly colored. Uh, you often see it grown inside and um, looks like a coleus. And here's a begonia. And that was blooming in early December in my garden, a tuberous begonia. And of course the famous uh, dahlias with the beautiful stripes. Now, this phrase, I'm sure you've heard before, um, now that we've had our, our bit of eye candy. Um, is, is a real key, as I said, when we were talking about botany. Right plant, right place. Take a little time to begin um, looking at your garden and your gardens are going to be changing. This winter in particular, um, do, a, do a rough map and note where the spots are wetter than they used to be, or you've begun to have a little seasonal stream. Um, and last summer, I'm sure you all remember those dry spots that got terribly dry. Those are all areas that bulbs will be affected positively and negatively in. Um, take a moment while your memory is good over the winter, just do a rough map, just doesn't matter. Uh, if it's special, just so you will remember this, 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 and this and make a huge difference next year to you. Um, and there's, uh, there's my Calianthus um, because we have three planting groups. So you have three windows. Now your first one is what we're doing now. You buy in the autumn and you plant now. Um, now with all the rain, don't panic. You can plant through December. Once you get into January, they're wanting to move into growing. And remember, they do a lot of growing underground before they ever stick their noses up. And um, they're gonna bloom this, well, the same winter. They're gonna start blooming in January and February. And then depending on what their seasonal cycle is, they'll go into next autumn. This is what's called the winter hardy group. The next group, um, you buy in the spring and you plant immediately. Um, they bloom the same year like um, lilies, dahlia, right? Um, and they are half hardy, some of them tender, like this uh, Calianthus that you see. Um, I keep it in pots and then bring the pots in because it's sensitive to too much moisture and it really won't take much of a freeze. So I, I take care of them in winter. But if you have an area that's warm or you can mulch it, uh, then um, you're gonna be protected. So that's the half hardy and the tender groups. Now we have another group um, and this is the, um, the group that we will often force. So we buy them in autumn 
we plant them inside um, and then they're gonna bloom early to late winter. We'll talk about forcing later on. Some of that group are hardy. Um, the, you know, the crocuses you see in the window, some of them are tender, some of them are tropical. So the uh, tender group, for instance, uh, a wonderful uh, hippiastrum, uh, which is um, some people call amaryllis, but is technically hippiastrum. Um, so back to right bulb, right place. On the left, there are some of my Siberian iris. So the science behind what is successful, which we've covered a lot, um, now let's focus on taking that science and knowing how and where to plant. So first of all, most important, group by water needs. And that's because the water needs of bulbs can be radically different between bloom time and dormancy time. Probably the best example of that is um, some, my mistake from several years back. Um, I bought some Babiana. Babiana are actually a North American native that um, are wonderful blue, uh, about a foot high. And they're just, they're kind of a meadow plant. They're really lovely. Well, they absolutely need drought during their dormancy. And I had a garden, that uh, a particular bed that was all blue. So I thought, oh, perfect, because this will fit right here down at the end of the bed that was really hard to get water to and got quite hot. So I figured, aha, boy, I'm so smart. So I put the Babiana in there. And then wouldn't you know, my neighbor decided to put in a shrub on her side of the fence and water it overhead. Well, my Babiana rotted. It only got a few sprinkles of water, but it got it every three or four days. And that's it, killed them. They needed absolute drought during summer. And there you go. Another one that needs a dry soil is our uh, camas because it um, evolved in the Gary Oak Meadow that can get as little as a uh, half an inch of rain during the hot summer months. Yet at bloom time, when we have our spring rains, boy, those bulbs will just get all plump and do their thing. The second most important thing is, is group them by soil type and fertility. Now that just means if they, uh, if, if the uh, um, planting instructions say um, loamy soil, then you know that you need a lot more compost, um, which is higher fertility. If they say like fast draining, um, sandy type soil, um, be aware of that. And if you don't have that soil, you can create that soil by raising the bed one foot and putting that type of soil in there. Um, so you really know what they need to take care of themselves underground for next year. So the soil fertility and the moisture um, level or the lack of moisture level are more important in the dormant season, whereas the sun and light needs are most important for bloom time. So this sounds very complicated, but actually it's not. And when you look at your uh, bulb instructions, uh, you'll say, aha, aha, right plant, right place. Now I know why they want me to do this because sun and warmth and the amount of moisture. Well, sometimes you'll, they just won't bloom. You didn't give them enough sun. So if it says dappled sun, it doesn't mean six hours of shade and two hours of sun in the afternoon. It means they would really be happy under a deciduous tree where you're getting light, but not heavy light. So finally, always remember the wild origins, um, which is sudden climate change. And also to remember, as I've put here, that garden beds do the same thing. They just do it in miniature. Think of the beds. There you are hauling the hose out. Oh, darn, you know, this hose, I got to water this one bed. 
Well, there are whole climates like that. Your garden is in miniature, which means that there's a bulb for almost every spot in your garden. Know which are hardy and which are tender in your growing zone, but also in your garden bed. I had one garden bed when I lived in Campbell River um, that never got sun, November, December, and half of January because the sun was low in the horizon and that part of the yard was surrounded by giant fir trees. <laughs> that ground froze solid. There are certain things I could not plant there. A note on growing zones. Um, the USDA's growing zones are no longer accurate for Canada. Um, we updated our growing zones um, in 2000 and Environment Canada um, made more changes to growing zones in British Columbia and Vancouver Island than they did for the rest of Canada. That's because we have such a varied climate. We go from the tundra at the top of Vancouver Island down to what's called warm summer Mediterranean. And since 2000, we have added climate zones that have never existed on the hot end um, in, uh, on Vancouver Island and in Canada before. It is very much a reality. So uh, we also break our climates down into A and B. Now, that's not so difficult um, to understand simply because the normal climate zones are 10 degrees. That means just freezing point is 10 degrees. They've split into A, which is five degrees. So I have things that will grow when the soil is cold at 35 and 40 degrees. You drop at five degrees and it's frozen. So use the, use the newer zones. And also know how deep and how far apart to plant them. And that's your basic science. And that will all be in the rest of the seminar. So not to panic. So here's some of the examples of uh, the plants that love sun. The majority of the bulbs are sun lovers. And you can see the array, okay, um, from Narcissus through um, that uh, iris is dream lover. And um, uh, through the dahlia, the uh, up here under the sign is um, uh, daylilies, the um, liatris, um, to the right, and then on the far upper left, that's some um, ornamental grasses and my gladiola peeking through, and again, um, our autumn uh, plant. And now here is kind of a really fun group, uh, and just, it's got to be my favorite group of bulbs, and they're the woodland bulbs. Now, um, I'm including these uh, because, in fact, most of our bulbs are woodland bulbs. So we have bluebells. Um, this little pink fellow um, I photographed um, last spring, and it is, I want to say dodecanthian, but it's not, um, um, erythonium. Um, and you see here is the alocasia that I had mentioned. Uh, you see it really is quite bright and beautiful. And it's one of the few bulbs that's grown for its foliage. You have the alocasia, you have the colocasia, you have the hosta, okay? And at the far right, you have um, um, uh, one of our wild woodland lilies. Isn't that exquisite? Um, looks very much like a martagon lily with the recurved blossom. And um, the tricertus, um, this is Pushkiniana uh, that decided um, it got washed out and grew up in the rocks between my rock wall and the driveway. Um, these are um, bog lilies from Van Tuzen, uh, that I shot from Van, Tuzen, uh, Van Dusen Botanical Garden um, right next to one of the trees that I uh, adopted there. And on the bottom uh, right, um, 
are the hardy cyclamen, which actually you can buy different genuses or different species, and you can have uh, them blooming every month of the year. So um, you, you can see in this group how varied are the um, different light and water needs. Everything from the zephyrins uh, or zephyrines uh, that love the water to the fancy ranunculus, which are uh, buttercup. Um, along the bottom there, that's our native um, Fritillaria mealagris that I grew in my garden. Um, next to that is a woodland with, I got the, I uh, photographed this in Ontario, and this is Trillium grandiflorum. Just above it, you'll see our Western Trillium, which is Trillium ovatum, um, much longer, uh, um, more narrow um, petals. Um, upper right, we have the delightful Chiona doxa, and you see there is more than one color as well. And in the bottom left, we have the Zatendentia, which is the calla lily. Now, here we've got plants that are actual shade lovers. They do not want full sun. They'll take dappled light, um, but they do not want full sun. Um, the upper left are actually the same plant, and I wanted to show you how different um, um, a bulb can appear at different times of the year. Um, uh, there's the spath um, and, uh, of the arum italicum, and then it produces these berries uh, in autumn. Now, if you have children, they're poisonous. And you know how kids are. Oh, that looks like a lollipop. So do be careful on some of these shade plants. They have some of the most unusual flower forms um, that we have. The upper right, um, Jack in the Pulpit. Okay, that's a uh, Arasarum, and that's a native uh, in uh, in the Ontario woodlands. Um, there are many forms of them, and you say they they have the hood over top, unlike the Arums. This little fellow down on the bottom. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. The upper right is the Aris, um, uh, ah, it's gone. They're very, they're very uh, similar, but in the bottom is the Ara, um, Arasarum and the top is the, uh, <laughs> it's, it's gone, I'm sorry, it ends in M-I, uh, but they're all related. Um, these woodland plants. And I, I got the uh, Arasarum to show you. Um, it's called uh, uh, probos proboscidium. Whew, my tongue is just not working today. Um, they call it the mouse plant and it is so charming. Um, I have friends that will grow them in pots, you know, next to the door. Oh, my pet mice. Here we have um, the Convalaria or the lily of the valley. Um, it does not like some and it can be quite spectacular in the shade, especially you see, I chose this one for the bright yellow stripes. So it, it's actually very bright um, in the shady area. And at the bottom left, we have the cyclamen. And I want you to take a quick look at those leaves. You see, this is one of the, another one of the few evergreen um, uh, perennials. Um, sometimes it will lose its leaves if you're having a harsh winter, but they're beautifully colored. Now, this is a, an important two types of bulbs. Um, the native bulbs and the species bulbs. The difference is very simple. Is, is very simple. All native bulbs are species bulbs, but the natives are the local are the local bulbs? All species bulbs are wild. Everything we have in the garden came from a species bulb, and we have many beautiful examples that we grow in the garden. And um, this one here, um, I shot last spring, uh, just here um, at uh, Thompson Memorial Park, and that's another Erythonium, the trout lily. It's called that because when you look at the leaves, they look like um, a trout underwater with the dark green and the light green, very beautiful. Um, so here is a, a species tulip, Tulip of Badalini that uh, um, I really enjoyed growing. It's shorter 
And so it gave um, color at a, at a particular height in the garden. Again, the deer didn't like it. Curious. Now, the thing about species bulbs is they're smaller, the blooms, they're also tougher. In other words, if you're not sure uh, whether it's gonna survive that spot, a uh, species bulb um, might, whereas a uh, hybrid will definitely not. They're also usually less expensive to buy. Now, when you combine them with bloom season with hybrids, you really extend the growing season of that particular genus because they tend to grow, uh, which is why they were popular, they tend to grow right at the edges of our seasons. They naturalize, and this is an important term, um, they spread throughout an area. We've all seen the, those exquisite pictures, and I did show you one in the woodland group um, of the trees with the great um, blue underneath it. Those were all English bluebells. And uh, we have several ones that naturalize, and um, they're fun because you can choose an area, you could plant, um, spread them very lightly throughout the area and they will come up here and there and here and there and then they slowly fill in the area and they will know where to stop you may have areas that you wanted to naturalize um, say you have a little uh, a little trickler through there uh, in winter and you'll notice that spot will not grow those bulbs they know enough how far to go and when to stop um, they're also longer lived um, most bulbs are very long-lived perennials. Um, the most obvious uh, difference um, I saw in the tulips. Tulips, hybrid tulips decline very quickly and um, the uh, species bulbs just live on and on. Now they often, often have more interesting foliage because they haven't been hybridized for spectacular flowers. And many of them offer multiple blooms so um, you have Narcissus, the little, the little uh, daffodil um, Narcissus called Poeticus. And it will have two or three small blossoms on a single stem with the yellow trumpet. And they have the most glorious um, aroma. So whereas many of you, your big fancy uh, tula, um, daffodils have no scent. Um, scent was less important than show. They also give this kind of informal appeal in the garden. You notice that this tulip isn't growing straight. <laughs> they do that. So they have a compact growth form and some very, very bright colors. I showed you that tulip atarda, brightest thing in the garden, um, but it's no more than four inches high and they have bright colors. Now, the native bulbs are quite important. I showed you the little erythonium, the white one, here is Erythonium image um, that uh, Ian Young from the Pacific Bulb Society took. Um, and it's in his garden. Look at the height of it. That's quite, quite a bit larger, quite fancy. Now, they're important for a couple of reasons. They're naturally suited to our garden environment. Um, they are very long lived. Um, they also help slow climate change because our gardens are an artificial environment with imported plants. And the more native plants that we can intersperse there, the more the climate recognizes itself and the less we are modifying the climate in small ways, but we're still modifying it. And they, uh, studies have proven that gardens in general, lawns, greenery, trees, as well as gardens that in, especially gardens that include a lot of native plants. And those native plants are often on the edges um, of a garden as a backdrop, um, because they might be shrubs or things like that, that they've been shown to stabilize the change in climate in urban and exurban areas. In other words, um, the, the suburbs. They also attract the wild pollinators. Uh, and um, that is very important as there is a decline in pollinators. No pollinators, very little food. 80% um, uh, of all flowers, like I'm just reading the stats here, um, and 90 different food crops 
depend on just bees alone and their friends. And um, that's a lot. And many wild pollinators are better at pollinating our food crops than honeybees are. For instance, the, our, one of our wild um, blue orchard bees, they will fly in the wind, they will fly colder, and they will fly farther. So important in, in that way. And um, just as beautiful, so why not help the climate? Um, there are also smart water choices. So if you, if you plant them in the right place, um, they kind of take care of themselves. They also um, attract the beneficial insects um, that will eat garden pests like aphid, things like that. So um, here are some natives and you'll notice all the pollinators. So again, we have the um, Meliagris and um, uh, the, is that the orange tail or black tail, uh, bumblebee? We have the tiger um, tail on the uh, wild lily. Um, here's on the upper right, here is a honeybee. And on the lower left, um, I photographed um, a long-horned bee, um, that's um, a wild pollinator, photographed another bumblebee um, on the bleeding heart, that's the wild bleeding heart. And here's in the bottom left are um, uh, camas, our camasia, uh, and there's a bee there. So let's look at the domestic bulbs for pollinators. Um, some of them are fruit crops. As you can see, this is um, uh, a wild bee on one of my um, alliums, my edible alliums. And here is a list um, which you have in your um, handouts. Common name on the left, um, botanical name on the right. And these were all photographed, um, all these little bugs uh, were photographed um, in my garden. Um, and except the hummingbird that uh, I believe is a rufus and that was um, of fine art America, I think. Here's, here's a group that people don't always consider. Oh, and I'm just getting some stuff here. There we go. And these are the edibles. One moment, get, get going here. Um, and this particular one is just a, a basket that I, uh, that I took out of my garden um, that was potatoes. Um, these were the Jap um, Egyptian walking onions, um, some sh uh, shallots and um, some uh, small multiplier onions. And here we have, we have garlic, um, the lovely different types of potatoes. Look at these chives. They're actually grown for ornamental um, um, down a walkway, just lovely. Um, some of my Walla Walla onions, those are sunchokes. At the bottom left, the amazing, amazing daylily. Every one of those parts of that plant is edible. And um, leeks, and then at the bottom right, you can see the sweet potato. Final group, the winter bulbs. This is the hippiastrum that grows in winter, one of the Christmas plants. And um, this particular uh, uh, table um, tells you about chill times and bloom times. Now, um, you do not need to chill the bulbs that you buy in the store. Sometimes just, and sometimes putting them in the fridge, all you're doing is creating an environment <clears throat> where they will um, mold. Leave your bulbs outside when you get them. Just keep them dry, leave them outside. But the point of forcing bulbs for indoor bloom is that you're 
you're making it cold enough that you're compressing the season. So they think that they've, uh, they've had a, a full season of rest and they're gonna bloom again. And that's why I've included these. Um, one of the, um, oh, we lost it, try again. One of the um, things about our climate is you'll see a lot of these bulbs when you look at your blooming calendar that are already blooming outside. But if you want those blooms inside, then you need to chill them. And again, you can chill them in the, in the fridge, which is the most logical place, but make sure there's some kind of desiccator with them or they may rot. And then this is the number of weeks that you'll get a bloom afterwards. Um, back East, it's often, um, a real treat when they don't get spring until May. Here we come to what um, we want to do with the uh, garden when we're doing bulbs. So design, design. Um, and you can see how someone has done just that. Cho chosen different heights, Put the pot there, plants are leaning out over the uh, walkway, and there's a viewing point. Look at this one. Isn't this something? I love that. So how do we do that? First of all, you're going to group by bloom season. Then you're going to group with compatible plants. Now, you don't usually think of this uh, tree as compatible with tulips, but it is, isn't it? And this designer wanted them to bloom all at the same time. So he chose something that would make a spectacular show. Then you group by desired visual effect. Well, this picture is obvious. Remember the effect of the one we just saw before, far more inviting and relaxing. And then you also group them in a complementary uh, hardscape. In other words, am I gonna have that swing there? Um, do I have a wall? that I want something bright against. Um, so here we have um, a whole group of plants showing you the depth and their height of bloom, as well as their time of bloom. So you see fall planted and spring planted. There we go. Um, your spring planted are usually more tender and they bloom later in the season than your fall planted. And here we have a table I made of pretty much um, all the bulbs you're gonna run into that are good for coastal gardens. And you'll notice the ones that have more than one season bloom time they've marked. And I've also marked the ones that are slightly tender. They may do really, really well next to your protected patio and getting a blast of heat from the house, um, or they might do great down in Victoria but they might not do very well in other places. So just be advised. You can always put them in a big planter or a pot, bring them inside. Here's another thing, um, very similar. This one is from Longfield Gardens in um, Northeast US, um, but I really liked it because it, it was a good graphic and gave you a good sense of bloom times. Here is how to, um, Put them in the ground, how many bulbs per square foot. So if you're planting en masse, um, rather than using a dibber, a single digger, you scrape back the whole area, make sure the soil is what you want, add some compost if needed, and then place them. Now, I, um, I found that uh, it's what I call the palm effect. So um, if I were to take my palm, as you can see, and put a bulb, as many as I could fit on my palm without touching each other, that's a good spacing. It's a very, very close spacing if you're doing a mass effect. But if you spread it out, um, uh, so on one finger, instead of putting three, you might put one. Um, then you will have enough area around the bulb so it can uh, um, get fed correctly. The other thing you don't do is put them in, um, is, there's this thing about, oh, just throw them on the ground, they look natural. No, they won't, they'll all roll into the hollow. And if that hollow is wet, 
the bulb might die. So make sure that you place them. And um, often if they naturalize, they'll grow in together. You can always put extra ones in next year, can't you? So here's the thing for um, the gardener that doesn't have a lot of ground. And the wonderful thing about bulbs is that you can layer them. And the, like the lower left is one of my bulb containers. Um, I um, had crocus, which were finished. And then my um, little um, grape hyacinths in front and um, a whole bunch of new um, hybrid um, narcissus that I bought, just lovely. I think that's Sunny Girlfriend, I believe. So some examples uh, in a pot, look at, they're very, very crowded. And when you crowd them like that, um, you can put them out in the garden again, but don't expect to bloom. Um, they will need a whole nother year to recover, but that's okay because you can take those, plant them out um, and interplant your new ones that will have bulb, that will have um, blooms that year. And then the following year, everybody will bloom. Um, some don't, um, depends on the quality of the bulb, depends how much they expended. I love this cutaway of the um, pot. Um, you notice how they've alternated them. So they always have a place to grow in between the other bulbs. Um, so extending the season. So now that you have this one idea, let's, um, uh, let's look at how to extend the season. I even did that in my um, planters um, and layering them. I have lilies in planters that are layered with earlier small season blooms, um, galanthus and some crocus um, and some short um, species daffodils. And um, they've been in that pot for five years. All they do is get fed. So you can extend the season um, on the left um, are alliums and look at the different heights. You could have a whole bed of alliums from short to tall, from spring through fall, nothing but onion plants. Isn't that great? And of course, iris again, look at that. Choosing the right iris, you can have something almost every um, month of the year, if you choose carefully and you have the right spot. Uh, again, extending the season. Here's your hybrid tulips and notice the heights again. So depending on where you put them in the garden, you would combine them with different plants. So you could see the, you could see the tulip at its best. And as the greenery dies down, shorter plants would hide the greenery. And I'm gonna make a quick note here, never cut the greenery off expended bulbs. All you're doing is make life hard. They need that greenery to photosynthesize, to feed the bulb for next year. So if you don't, if you can't stand it until they go, until the uh, um, leaves die back, plant something in front of it. Planting season and bloom time for domestic lilies. Look at that spring through autumn, just amazing. The bloom season, um, early, early summer, um, May and all the way um, down to late summer um, and different, different sh shapes, sizes, colors and flower directions because of their wild origin. You see, important to know wild origin, whether they point up, they point forward, or they point down. Remember I mentioned the, the curved um, petals of, the, of our um, Pacific um, Northwest um, woodland lily. So let's get down to the nitty gritty here. Basic rules for healthy bulbs. Choose your spot carefully. We already know that one, huh? Plant at the correct depth. Again, if you're not sure, plant a little deeper than you think. Now, you feed them with spring compost into the top of the soil. The idea that you're supposed to throw that dolaprill in the bottom of the uh, um, hole, no. Um, 
on the handout, I gave you the article from Dr. Linda Chalker Scott, read it. Um, always um, make the soil what it's supposed to be for the bulb. Replenish it with compost. Um, naturalizers need much less, less. They really love leaf mold. So make sure that um, this autumn, you take a couple of garbage bags, collect those leaves, um, put them in the plastic, stick them uh, in the plastic garbage bag, stick them out and let them rot all by themselves. Um, that will be a beautiful moldy mess that you add to your bulb beds um, next spring. Don't overfeed them. They would just grow themselves to death. Um, or you will have given them too rich an environment, they will actually not bloom. Don't cut back the greenery, let it fade. And respect the water needs when dormant. That's important. And divide when they get crowded. So diseases and pests. Luckily, we are so lucky. Um, oh, and before we go on to diseases and pests, what I have learned to use over the years for feeding my plants is I take my compost in the spring throw a wee bit of manure into it. Um, I always preferred horse manure, but you can buy composted uh, cow manure as well. Um, I um, would add um, uh, into my big planters um, because they use up so much more soil. I would also add um, a wee bit of um, kelp meal um, because that would give the all the minerals. Um, many of our bulbs um, are grown or their parentage is from the Middle East and from Mediterranean areas that have a higher mineralized soil than our slightly leached uh, forest um, soil has. And um, the, uh, the last thing I would always, always add is um, a small handful of um, worm castings. It includes, uh, besides, you might have a few uh, worm eggs in there, which is which is nice. The worms know how to come and go and help the soil. Um, and that also um, includes humic acid, which is the glue that creates the life of the soil. Um, it enhances um, all types of growth and um, breakdown um, to make food available to plants. So that's all I would have, have ever used with bulbs experimenting over the years. And um, I would um, compost um, in autumn um, when they were finished. So pretty much the same thing you're gonna do with the rest of your garden. Um, with um, the bulbs and containers, I would simply add a little bit more because the containers um, soil gets used up. Sometimes I dump the soil out, give it a whole fresh start and replant the bulb. Um, but don't overfeed. When you're, if you're going to mulch over winter, make sure that those um, plants that um, need their tubers or tuberous roots or rhizomes close to the surface, that you don't begin to bury them with something that's gonna hold too much moisture. So we're done with that. Diseases and pests. We are very lucky, there are very, very few, naturally with most bulbs, um, and naturally in this area. Now, the plants that have the most diseases are the ones that we have um, domesticated for longer. Um, here uh, on the coast, we have daylily midge, and it's this uh, little guy that gets into the buds of the, of the, uh, um, the daylily, and uh, when you see it, the, the bud is all contorted. And um, I got rid of mine simply by watching very carefully. And when I would get a, mi a misformed, deformed bud, I would snap it off immediately and destroy, um, destroy it. And within two years, I had no more midge. Um, Daylily rust, you can see that picture there, looks very much like allium rust, um, but far more prominent. And it um, simply disrupts the leaves uh, ability um, to photosynthesize. So you're best to lift that plant. And if you have um, quite a few plants of it, 
you lift everybody, unfortunately, best to destroy them and and leave that leave that area untouched um, by lilies, plant something else um, for about three years. And that's the only way you'll get rid of it. Allium rust um, usually appears on edibles only, your leeks and your garlic. With severe infestations, you get a very, very poor crop. And um, I've had some rust um, uh, on a few leaves. I cut that leaf off and um, I was lucky. I didn't have a big infestation, have no idea where it came from. Um, I probably brought it in on some soil without knowing it. And, um, uh, um, so did not have, did not lose a crop. Our main pests, there we go, slugs, earwigs, birds, raccoons, and deer. Well, we've talked about deer, what they will eat and not eat. Um, the uh, raccoons will dig at um, the ground in early spring. What they're really after, just like the birds, is they're after the little grubs and the worms. And of course, um, all plants um, have a, um, are thermogenic, if you will. They have a kind of heat that's different from the surrounding soil and um, they just get in the way. And the raccoons and the birds, they'll tear them out of the ground or damage them while they're trying to get at something else. 70% of all plant problems are, cultiva are cultivation and storage. Again, remember what we needed to have a healthy garden. So too little, too little water, not enough water, uh, some kind of rot, fungus or mold if you haven't stored them correctly, um, no blooms because you've either um, not given them the correct light or you've, or you've decided they needed food and you fed them to the point where all they did was grow and they didn't bloom. You disturbed their normal cycle. So the last part is um, buying and storing. Now, um, the three H's, healthy, heavy, hard like a rock. If they don't feel like that, don't buy them. Um, a sick bulb is not a bargain. Um, also, they need to feel dry. Um, if they have kind of a, a I'm lucky because my hands are dry and so I can feel moisture on something very easily. Um, uh, buying in bulk, I have done that and it's worked very well, but you got to pick them over or you got to look at that bag very carefully. You can see the, the big bag of bulbs here on the right. Um, and I included that fork because if you're going to be digging for bulbs, that's much better to dig with than um, a trowel. Uh, now, again, um, you get seconds in these in these in these bulk ones, which can be just fine. If you have a really good area, um, that's okay. Um, and um, we talked about chilling as opposed to storing and how to follow instructions, but plant to the instructions. You can't just tuck them away for a year. They need to have their annual cycle. So what do you do if you buy too many? Easy, put them in pots, give them as gifts. Now here we have our list. This list is the same as the, the other list that you got um, from um, April. Uh, the difference is, is that on reading these books, I tried to point you to certain things um, that will um, suit your interest more. Here are some good websites I've come across. Um, everything from how to grow things to downloading calendars, um, kind of neat. Um, and what else? I think that's about it. Um, let's, uh, let's go on to questions with my final slide. There's my beautiful Dykes winner, Jesse's song. Beautiful. And Joanne, can I just say, I think it's a testament to your excellent handout that was emailed out to everyone. And if you didn't get that uh, maybe put it in the chat. We'll make sure to get it to you. Joanne sent out a really comprehensive handout. Um, and I think it answered everybody's questions. And that's why we're not seeing questions in the chat. Maybe Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I just bored them to death. Although, no. although uh, Joanne mentioned squirrels being a problem. And, and you're quite right, Joanne. Squirrels, uh, squirrels can dig um, uh, just as well as raccoons. 
Um, but again, um, most bulbs are actually not edible. Um, so the squirrels may grab them and haul them off thinking they're acorns. Um, but I myself had far more problems with raccoons um, than I ever did with squirrels, but quite right, thank you for reminding me. And also with regards to deer, um, the uh, tulips are deer candy. I had um, a misadventure with the deer and all those new beautiful um, uh, narcissus that I showed you in the pot because I got arrogant and didn't think I had to dig so far down because it took too long. Well, I planted them slightly too shallow. A young doe came by. Um, no, she hadn't read um, the books that said that um, daffodils are poisonous and deer won't eat them. So she went to one and it just had its bud up and I'm really excited waiting for that bloom. And she reaches down and bites the edge off the, or bites the bud off the top of the daffodil. And um, of course, it's, it's got um, 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 oxalic acid in it. And she goes, oh, wow, Pew! spits it out. The problem is, is that they don't, when, when browsers browse, they get their teeth around something and they wrench it and they pull it. So my bulb wasn't low enough in the ground. So, and the ground was damp. So not only did she bite the top off of the, uh, of the plant, she pulled the bulb out of the ground. And that was it for that year because right after her came the little fawn who went, mom, and mom, gotta go with mom and ran over and crushed the bulbs. <laughs> so be sure to plant correctly. Um, okay, any other questions? Looks like we are done. A lot of um, compliments. And Joanne, <laughs> Joanne, should we chat about the great feedback that we've got so far over the past oh, few yes. months and that are informing next year's workshops? Great. I do see a couple of questions. Just sorry before you jump. Oh, into here that. we go. Yes. Tips for keeping crocosmia from falling over. Can I plant them deeper? They seem to rise up in the soil. These are very good points. Um, if a plant is rising up in the soil, it's because its contractile root does not have enough room to pull it down in the soil. Also, remember what we're talking about corms uh, where they exhaust themselves and put the new corm on top? So if your soil um, is such that you're getting things up, it means that they're not able to pull themselves down. And so that will um, cause them to rise in the soil. Um, I'm sure that that's what that is instead of winter heaving because um, that has a completely different effect. And that's part of the reason why the crocosmia falls over. The other part of the reason is that they're big and heavy on top and not very um, heavy on the bottom and they're planted shallowly anyway. And they tend to lean out on this long, beautiful raceme. And then because a lot of people will plant them um, along the house, so they make a good show, um, they are leaning towards the light. Um, if you're having problems with it, um, I uh, have been known to simply stick stakes through the bed and then just weave a bit of uh, green garden um, uh, wire uh, where it can't be seen and simply hold up the bottom eight inches of the uh, of the plant, but they naturally lean. Um, Mardigon lily, and it grows and never blooms. Well, that's a good one. They need moisture. They need that good composty forest soil. They need dappled light. Um, try moving it. If it's in, a, and what you might try is put it in a big planter, give it exactly the right conditions for a year, see if it blooms. If it hasn't done anything for three years, send it to the big compost bin in the sky. Um, last year, I had many tulips that didn't bloom, buds came up, but looked spent. The buds were dry, like aborted blooms. Could that have been a virus? It could have been. Um, Unless I'm looking right at the tulips, um, I, I wouldn't um, venture a guess, but often distorted um, blooms are indicative of a virus. Um, I would take the whole bunch out if you can. 
um, because something is definitely wrong there. And it's seriously enough wrong that you're better to replace them. Um, when in planting tulips in containers, oops, I'm trying to get, there we go. When the flower dies, do I remove the bulbs and greenery? No, um, not right away. If you want healthy tulips next year, and of all our bulbs, tulips decline more quickly. They have been domesticated since 1550. That's a lot of hundreds of years. The only other bulb that's been domesticated um, that long is the lily. So important in French um, icon, um, as a French icon for both religion and culture. Um, that greenery is needed. Uh, I have lifted a bulb, I have lifted tulips before they're finished, but I put them back in the ground again. And I've been very careful not to disturb the root. So I've lifted, lifted the area, kept the soil around the root, put it in a place where it couldn't be seen and let it finish. And then you can reuse your container. Okay, we got another new message here. How often do you divide or is it necessary? The iris will always tell you whether it's a uh, Ungularius, um, whether it's a Sibiricum um, or Sibirica, um, whether it's the Dutch bearded, they will always tell you. The, tuber the, tu the tuberous uh, or the, rhizome, the rhizomes um, get crowded. Some of them are right up out of the soil. Um, you will find the, the tops will get sunburned, the ends will get rotted. I take one of those big old forks and I dig all around the edge of the bed, but I dig way, way down and lift the whole group to preserve as many of the roots. Then I drag it out on, onto a dry spot and I very carefully tease each one apart. And um, you'll be just you you'll realize um, uh, when they need to divide your your flowers are not as um, good. They're shorter. Um, your bloom time is shorter, and they take to dividing very um, very readily. Just look at the health of the plant at ground level, and it will tell you a lot. What are the best bulbs to integrate into the lawn? Well, I'm a lazy gardener. My bulb is always uh, Crocus tamisiana. Um, it is a species Crocus. It's that beautiful, translucent, uh, bluey mauve with the pink. And um, it readily um, uh, propagates by seed as well. And the birds um, and the bees um, love it. And so they will also, um, uh, spread the pollen. And uh, I always plant it out close to where my lawn is and they just march into the lawn. And of course they like the lawn as long as your thatch isn't too deep because they're protected. Nothing can get at them. Um, you can plant almost anything in a lawn. If you've driven along the um, um, Stanley Park uh, um, uh, highway through the park there, you'll see all those daffodils. Um, they're all they've all gone feral. They've just naturalized. I'm sure it must be their great, 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 great grandchildren because 60 years ago, we used to stop and look at those. Uh, my husband likes to mow. Uh-huh. Well, um, the politics of marriage. Um, first of all, a healthy lawn should not be any shorter than an inch and a half. And if you use um, the bulbs like Chianodoxa, um, uh, crocus, um, all the early bulbs, they're pretty much finished by the time you're gonna mow. Um, do rabbits eat iris reticulata? I've never seen any. Um, I've had rabbits eat the tops of my hyacinths. The little nubs just come up in the leaves and they mow the top. And so all my hyacinths that year had crew cuts. Um, Can you tell us about the bulb in your background? Goodness. Um, well, this is more about gardening. The bulbs in my background have been a study since I was a child and um, um, picking um, the brains of horticulturists 
and constantly reading for 25 years and experimenting in my own garden. Um, uh, so that's, um, that's the, the master gardener's life. <laughs> um, but I have grown um, a lot of the uh, common bulbs and um, uh, tried lots of things and made a thousand, thousand mistakes. Um, and I think okay, some of those um, the walking onion. Uh, the walking onion is uh, uh, the uh, Egyptian onion. And this is the picture you see behind me. Um, they uh, come from an area in the Mideast where the ground is very hard. And um, so they set, they're called top set onions. So rather than producing the bulbeel or the, the bulbette, depending on um, uh, uh, what it is, um, whereas like the lilies produce the cormel above ground as well as the new corm underground, um, that's what this Egyptian walking onion does. And it um, produces the, uh, little, uh, the little bulbeel and each one has a little green stick sticking out of it. And you can take them apart um, and plant them one at a time, or you can just take that whole bunch and make sure it's turned around because you'll see the roots and you stick that in the ground. And they quote, walk because they fall over. And um, because they come from an area where the ground is very hard and very rocky, um, they produce it in a clump. So one contractile root will grab um, at least and hold that bunch. And uh, I loved having Egyptian walking onions in my garden because they produced this very, very strong, wonderful sweet onion flavor that I could add to food without adding a lot of bulk. Um, anything else? I think we're about done. Can you see anything? Uh, I saw just just two others. Uh, oh, okay. Somebody asked, somebody asked, what is the longest living tulip? Do you know? Oh, <laughs> now, if you mean the oldest tulip, um, that would be one of the species tulips. In terms of longest living, I couldn't tell you that, whether it's the early single or the late double or whatnot. Um, <clears throat> I do know as a rule that after three or four years, um, tulips begin to decline. I grew a special tulip for my mother the year that um, I was able to get it. It was the year that it won the um, Royal Horticultural Award. It was called Princess Irene, an exquisite tall tulip that was orange with purple on the, on the, on the edges and blue on the bottom and was beautifully scented. And since then, I've always grown Princess Irene. I keep her in a pot because the don't want the deer. Um, but after um, three years, they were only about six inches high. Um, and um, they really declined in terms of not every bulb would bloom. So I simply replaced them. Um, but the species tulips, um, are old. As I say, the first, uh, when I was doing some research a little while back, uh, 1550, um, the Ottoman Turks um, started trading their tulips um, with Western Europe, and they were growing them much um, longer than that. So that's all I know on that. Anything else? Great. I think that, so one person mentioned that they have a really clay soil <clears throat> and besides just building up soil on top of that, did you have mm. any other tip? Um, actually clay soil can be a wonderful soil when you add a bit of drainage to it because it is very um, uh, rich in minerals. And um, as you know, minerals are very good for roots and bulbs. So by amending the soil to make sure that it has the right kind of drainage, um, you will grow very good bulbs in a, in a clay soil. And um, when we went to Le Conner, uh one year, um, I, we looked closely at the soil and boy, you can see that it is that, that gray clay soil um, that is formed behind the riparian areas. And if you look at some areas um, uh, in Abbotsford, um, as we've been watching the disaster there, um, that was a lake 
um, that got silted up. And um, that whole area is further inland in the tidal bore than any place in North America. And so it would get um, lots of salt and lots of minerals uh, deposited all the time and it grows fabulous bulbs.